Okay, let's continue with Romans chapter 4. One of my favorite uh, passages in the Bible. Lots of good stuff there. And um, we'll be talking about Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith, wasn't he? He didn't have the Moses Mosaic law or the law of Moses. Moses came later. So Abraham, imagine believing in a God and not having scripture. Believing that God is all-powerful, but no one has told you that he's all-powerful. There was no Psalm 139. There was no Psalm 119. He didn't have written special revelation. And when you look at this man of faith, who in the book of Hebrew, in the Hall of Faith chapter, you just look at what he went through. He wasn't perfect, but boy, that was a man of faith. We have the scriptures. We can trust in the promises of God. He just heard from God, you know, somehow through his mind, the Lord spoke to him and he was obedient for the most part. So in verse one, uh, Paul moves in to make a contrast. He's just discussed the law. He's just discussed atonement and justification and that man is under the umbrella or blanket of sin and all are sinful and um, the law condemns us, and uh, there's grace through the blood of Christ, and that's where it's at. So now he moves on and picks the patriarch, father, you know, the Jewish father, the father of the Hebrews, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Abraham is the father of the Jews. So he moves in to make um, comparisons of Abraham's life to substantiate the arguments that are presented in chapters 2 and 4. I mean, chapters 2 and 3, and uh, also uh, latter part of 4. He does a summary of what we already talked about. So he says in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? What was it that Abraham discovered? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and he was credited to him as righteousness. It doesn't say that Abraham was justified by works. It doesn't say that Abraham was justified by taking Isaac up to Mount Moriah. It doesn't say that he was justified because of that. He believed God, and the belief in Yahweh, his God, was accredited to him as righteousness. So he was declared righteous because of his belief in the Almighty. He was faithful to his call. God called him out of the land of Ur, Chaldees, you are a place of ancient polytheism. Says, leave. He left his parents behind and he went. You know, where? To a place that I will tell you. Just start walking. That's uh, incredible. So he was obedient to his calling. Likewise with us, you know, when it comes to ministry, we must only enter the ministry if we're truly called by God. You know, you can see, uh, look up John 15. Uh, verse 16 and Matthew 9:38. Uh, Paul the Apostle also, Paul who wrote Romans, I'm moving now from Abraham to make a few comparisons with Paul, Paul describes himself as chosen by God, that he was separated or set apart for the defense of the gospel. For the defense of the gospel he was appointed. See Galatians 1. In fact, Paul was set apart in three different ways. Um, this has to do with being called to ministry. He was set apart at his birth in Galatians 1.15. Uh, at his conversion, remember in Damascus, at Cornelius' house, Acts 9.15. And he was separated or set apart at his call as a missionary. You have that in Acts 13, verse 1 and 2. Now, as for Abraham, he not only believed God and was declared righteous because of this belief, but he was even declared righteous before circumcision came into place. Verse 4. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift. You know, you go to work and you get your paycheck. It's not like it's a gift. Merry Christmas. You earned that. You earned the gift. The gift of salvation, it's like a Christmas present. You can't earn it. It's just given to you freely. So, Paul says here in verse 4 of chapter 4, Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. You met the contract. You, put, you did the due, and they pay you the dough. Verse 5. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is accredited 
to him as righteousness. Did this verse now tell us to be couch potatoes and not work? No. You don't deserve to eat if you don't work. That's a scriptural principle. We ought to work hard. Work hard at everything we do. Work as unto the Lord. You know, a miserable boss and these miserable co-workers that you have, you're right there for a reason. Do unto others as you would want them to do to you. Um, work uh, for your boss as if it's the Lord. You know, Obama's president, a lot of things I can't stand about that man. The Lord raises up kings, appoints them, and he tears them down and removes them. You know, nothing escapes his sight. You know, you could say we got Obama because we deserve him as a nation, possibly. You know, but the bottom line is we ought to pray for our leaders. Interesting. And sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes that is hard to do. So, however, verse 5, to the man who does not work but trusts in God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is accredited as righteousness. This is talking about salvation. It's not talking about not having a job and being a missionary and just milk the state. That's not what this is about. So, verse 6, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from from works, right? What did David do after he committed a sin with Bathsheba and kill, had her husband killed? What did he do? Did he go feed the homeless? Did he um, fast for 40 days? Uh, did he have a leg to stand on and say to God, look, I did all these works, now you better forgive me? No. Verse 7 says, Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Is this blessedness only for those that are circumcised? Paul asked. Or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was accredited, accredited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? <laughs> it was not after, Paul says. It was before. He was justified and declared righteous before he was circumcised. Verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that the righteousness might be accredited to them. There you have it. He's the father of the circumcised and the uncircumcised. He was declared righteous. Abraham was prior to circumcision. It just sort of sealed his faith. It was an act of uh, obedience, just like baptism doesn't save. You know, the thief on the cross who says, Lord, remember me wherever you're going. The Lord says, didn't say get down and be immersed or be sprinkled or you must be baptized. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Baptism is a, a duty for the believer. It's something that we want to follow through. It's a public expression. I'm going to bury my, my old life into the grave and rise with Jesus and rise anew. So it's an act of obedience. Same thing with circumcision. So... Um, verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe. Verse 12, and he is also the father of the circumcised who, who not only are circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. You know, you think of Gentiles who don't have the scripture, you know. I was talking about um, natural theology and general revelation earlier. We, all, we have enough light. Now on this side of the cross, right, um, they have to believe in Jesus, you know. Whoever confesses with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord shall be saved. Um, not so in the Old Testament, okay. So in this sense, um, you can look at Abraham's faith like this. His faith that declared him righteous was the base or the foundation for his salvation, while circumcision sort of sealed his salvation as an act of obedience. We see a similar theme in David, who found no refuge at all in the law of Moses, but rather threw himself at God's grace to rid himself of his terrible guilt. I mean, read Psalm 32 and 51, and you're going to see a broken man 
and that's what sin does to us it's sin or what looks wrong can look so enticing you know I want to be with that woman I want to do this I want to commit that act I want to I want to smoke that pipe uh, I want to drink that uh, I'm just gonna do it my way and boy doesn't it always backfire it's not worth it that guilt and remorse where you feel like you re-crucified Jesus again it's not worth it and you look at you look at King David King of Israel who penned down massive amounts of the Psalms you just see him so broken anyway uh, in the following verses we have some very good news for both Abraham and for us verse 13 it was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world but through the righteousness that comes through faith verse 14 for if those who live by the law are heirs receivers faith has no value and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath the law condemns the law is a schoolmaster to point us to something else that is needed that's why the Old Testament needs a New Testament Jeremiah talked about that right uh, there's going to be another um, set of uh, uh, another what is the verbiage that he uses uh, you know a promise a new covenant um, that's futuristic yet to come of course the Jew will say that is not the New Testament well what is it then right uh, for if those who live by law are heirs faith has no value and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath and where there is no law there is no transgression so the law was there to point out our transgressions so we can recognize we need a savior you know must have some standard by which to test ourselves and then we have another conclusion marker in 16 verse 16 says therefore the promise comes by faith so that here's the good news so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring is that just ethnic Israel no not only to those who are of the law but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham he is the father of us all as it is written I have made you a father of just Israel is that what it says no I have made you a father of many nations plural so many nations refers to Gentile nations Abraham is not just the father of the Jews but is also a spiritual father to the believing Gentile world these promises made to Abraham were based on faith and not the law how so because the law again only brings condemnation you can see that in chapter 4 16 through 25 this 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 could only mean one thing due to the promises being based on faith such faith is available to everyone and if a person places his faith in Jesus Christ the believer becomes a true spiritual offspring if you will of Abraham thus just as Paul said we are justified by faith through grace the same was the case with Abraham there was no law there not yet now in Hebrews I'm going to try to wrap this section of verses up uh, real fast uh, a lot of stuff to cover though let's see if we can get through at least part two here in Hebrews we read of Abraham in the in what's called the, the great hall of faith now in Genesis 22 the first book of Moses we see the ultimate example and um, obedience and faith work worked out in the life of Abraham remember he had no Bible no scripture no nothing he's just running around in the wilderness trusting this voice in his head or however God communicated to him then you see people coming up and they're angels disguised as human beings I mean, he had a busy life you know but in um, in Genesis 22 uh, I want to share this whole passage with you sometime later God tested Abraham he said to him Abraham and Abraham said here I am he replied then God says take your son your only son Isaac whom you love and go to the region of Moriah sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about all right so Mount Moriah is a is a string of hills it's not really mountains like you think of the Himalayas or the Andes or Mount Everest it's just a sort of like a hilly region so put this into perspective 
He calls him out of the land of polytheism of Ur, out of Chaldeans. I'm going to send you into the land of milk and honey. Where is that? Just keep walking. And then one day he says, hey, I want you to take your son, your only son, which is kind of confusing because he already had Ishmael. Remember, the Egyptian maid, uh, Sarah, his, his, his wife had a brilliant idea. She's like, listen, we're not going to have kids. I'm too old. So go sleep with the maid so you can have a son. That was Ishmael. He was born before Isaac. And by the way, Ishmael is the birth of the Arabic people. Isaac is the first Jew. Maybe now you can understand the Middle East conflict. Um, but having said that, is um, offer your son as a burnt offering? That's what the pagans were doing. Pagan religion, burning their kids. You know, to Molech, and I mean, you just look at what the Babylonians did, uh, and so forth. You know, having orgies while they're burning their kids. Are we any better? Well, people have orgies today, and then you just go and abort their fetus, abort their baby. So uh, we're not more moral than some of those people were. That's for sure. But um, what would you do if God says, hey, go to a region over there that I'm going to tell you, and uh, I want you to burn your son? I would have thought devil spoke. What is he up to? What is the Lord up to? And will Abraham see it through? Um, I knew I wasn't going to be able to cover Genesis 22 in this session, but I will the next. All right? Stay tuned.